Hey internet, what's up? It's your boy Wes, uh, back here with another video. So this topic is is something that's been kind of rolling around in my head really nonstop over the past like 72 hours or so. Uh, it was almost one of those revelation things, the, 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 the clouds parted away and I was able to see the light a little bit. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of share this idea with you about going further faster. Or, or what I mean by that is, what is the one thing that you should work on that maybe isn't a technique, but maybe your mindset to go further in your creative endeavors? Uh, but before we get started in the actual kind of narration and time lapse and stuff, I wanted to give a big shout out to everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, the digital painting overview is going crazy right now. It's a, the over hour and a half long look. Uh, of all the painting softwares. I love to see all the comments and what everybody has said and what your favorites are and what you've yet to try. Like, please keep commenting. It's a lot of fun. I love talking with everybody. I read the reviews every day and all the comments and stuff like that. So that's been a lot of fun. And also be sure to check out the free tutorial I posted on using a limited palette, namely the Zorn palette, and create a landscape with it. Uh, kind of simplify your ideas in regards to color and worry uh, more about warm and cool and all that stuff. But if you haven't checked that out, please do so. I think there's a lot to like in there. I'm pretty happy with how that painting turned out. But without further ado, let's go into our topic of going further, faster, while we take a look at a fantasy-inspired, time-lapse, uh, landscape, cool little deal. But uh, we'll see you then. All right, so let's get started. So I wanted to talk about what this piece was. Um, the, it kind of goes in with the theme of what this episode is, but uh, I'm a big fan of old school role-playing games. Doesn't matter if they were Japanese role-playing games, Western role-playing games. Um, if it had stats and you could level up and uh, do that type of thing, I was all in. And, <laughs> uh, you know, before my YouTube channel dedicated itself to art and kind of tutorials and discussions and all that stuff, I tried my hand at being a YouTuber, a gaming YouTuber, and realized I didn't have much to say on the topic. Like, I worked for different freelance places and had some cool podcasts and stuff that I did for years and years and years. And I loved it because I've always loved gaming uh, and RPGs and stuff as a hobby, but realized that I didn't really have a lot to add to the conversation. So one of my favorite games, um, I've always loved kind of the D and D RPGs. And one of my favorites is Neverwinter Nights. And there's, a, I have a box copy of the Neverwinter Nights Diamond Edition, which is the original Neverwinter Nights um, and all of the expansions and stuff like that. So I love that game. I actually bought it on Good Old Games, uh, GOG.com, before they had, I guess, the, the HD or the remaster, enhanced edition, uh, what, whatever Beamdog has made. But now you can't find the Diamond Edition anymore, which is weird. I know it's a weird off-topic thing. But I wanted to think, okay, I want to do like a fantasy landscape inspired by the Neverwinter Nights thing. And then I saw the word Diamond, and I was like, well, what if I use a diamond as my, as my kind of motif, as my design language? Because something that I've been kind of going through is I think I'm looking at all my stuff and my portfolio and things like that. And I'm like, why am I not getting the type of a lot of the type of gigs that I maybe have dreamed about getting or whatever? And, you know, I've I've had the honor to work on uh, Warhammer 40K. I've done stuff for Warner Brothers and Mad Max and. I've done, uh, I, I'm still currently um, one of the senior artists for Guildhouse Games and their card game Varia, which I love to death. That is such a fun gig. I get to reinvent myself all the time and it's a lot of fun. But, you know, I grew up looking at these fantasy things and reading the Forgotten Realms novels and Dritz and that's kind of where my imagination is. So having outlets to kind of go there mentally and artistically is a lot of fun. 
But anyways, this is about, I, I promise that whole prelude leads to something. Um, I, I had this idea, almost this epiphany about three or four days ago. And I don't know if you all have those, like you'll have your down slumps and then something will make sense. And then you get all this new energy to go create stuff. But I'm in a high right now, which is pretty good. And I realized, why did I get into this wanting to create and wanting to draw and work for these companies and share these stories artistically? Why, why did I get into that in the first place? And over the past probably six or seven months, I have been very study-driven. I've been very study-driven. I want to say... I have either read or done sketches or, and a lot of this stuff is never going to be shown. It's not really good enough to publish, but that's not even the point of it. It's really to study. It could be renders. It can be, oh, I'm going to draw five squares in perspective and then light it from three different lighting angles. Like that type of stuff. I've been grinding on that for, you know, five-ish months, at least six hours a day. Um, this is now my full-time job. And I've always made the joke on my channel, hey, if I want to be a pro, I better be able to draw a box in perspective. And that's just the reality. If I want to consider myself a professional, I should know the fundamentals. However, I, I got so bogged down, and it, some part of my brain is still this way, that I'm so bogged down in these fundamentals in training and doing reps and and grinding out the, you know, oh, well, what's my color theory and what is my value pass and where is my light coming from? And really thinking about the intricacies of creating the art, I stopped caring about the art. It, that was uh, the, the, the final product was not my end goal. You know what I mean? Like I got into this, uh, I'm going to call it a rut and I'm still kind of in it, but I think I'm clawing my way out of it, which is exciting of worrying so much about the process, I don't care about the end product. And I think maybe part of that is healthy because as an artist, as a professional artist, and if you're working with art directors and things like that, you may have to drastically change stuff that you've worked on, stuff that you put your heart and soul into or whatever, and then they're like, actually, can we make it backlit instead of frontlit? And then you have to reevaluate everything and use all those tools in your arsenal and all that training, and that, that comes in handy. And that's where the time spent doing that study is worth its weight in gold because now you're no longer scared to tackle that type of deal. Um, and you know, whatever the art director wants, the art director gets, and that's, <laughs> that's, that's the rules. But at a certain level, and it sounds really weird to say, but you know, I feel like on a few of my bigger projects, on some of my earlier Varia work, on um, a few of my Warhammer pieces, like I'm really proud of two out of the four pieces I've done for Warhammer. The other two, I feel like I let myself down and I let the company down because I was so worried about making something that they would say yes to. I stripped it of any sort of me that was in there. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I followed those formulas and I followed the this and I did 3D block outs to make sure the lighting's right. Like I did all this and it was so mathematical at some point it wasn't artistic anymore. And I think the pieces suffered for that. I think, you know, and this may not be true, but I always think that like, you know, I told the story about one of those. I had to go back and had, I had like 32 revisions because we just couldn't find it. I think I was so worried about you know, oh my God, this is it. I'm working for Warhammer. Holy crap. Like I've dreamed about this. Uh, and I freak out and I don't let my instinct take over. And it's a, it's a weird place to be whenever you acknowledge that, yes, you've made professional work, but was it to the best of your ability? And of course we're going to improve all the time, but I think there's a way to go further faster. And th this is what I mean by kind of the clouds went away and the light shined through. I realized, why did I get into this in the first place? And, you know, every artist has to have that existential crisis moment of like, oh, why am I doing this? Like, I know there's something here, but what is it? And I'm finding mine out is I want to make worlds. I want to make places that people want to invest in or want to explore or... They just want to look at it and escape just for that minute to wonder what it would be like to be there. 
like that excites me to no end because I know that feeling. I playing Never Winter Nights, it was my escape. I was like, oh my gosh, this whole thing, all oh my spells. And look, if you get equipment, it you actually wear the equipment and your character looks different. So you're part of this world. It's all world building. It's why I love Tolkien. It's why I love reading like Dragonlance and you know, uh, my bookshelf is 95% fantasy, fantasy stuff because I just love it. I love that idea of being able to shut your eyes and envision this place. And, and you, get to, you get to go there. I mean, my daughter's name is Shire. Uh, my, her middle name is Shire. For that exact reason. The, the hobbits love the Shire. And no matter how dark things that got, no matter how stressful it got, no matter how scared they were, they always thought of the Shire to go back to. And it was like home. And that is my fuel. That's my gasoline. That's sort of like, okay, I need to, I, I need to make these places that I feel like I want to go in. And this painting that we're doing right now, I wanted to kind of play with that. I wanted to be like, okay, let's do a fantasy landscape. Let's have an explorer. Maybe he has a shield. Maybe he has a sword. Uh, and he, he views a cool waterfall thing and it has this diamond motif and, you know, and it has a uh, kind of the bigger than life things. And I think later in the piece, I actually, there, there's a middle section there that has the, the little rock formation in the foreground. And I end up putting a diamond there. And I was like, okay, what if he's discovering stuff? And then, uh, then start adding uh, accoutrements and stuff to the kind of the canyons, doors, outside angles and stuff like that, just to kind of build up this motif of the shapes. And I noticed the more I was doing that, the more excited I would get because I was like, oh, now what if this happened? And what if this happened? And what if this happened? And I, I want to say that these type of pieces actually, for my mind and my mental state, go further in achieving my goal faster than if I'm so bogged down on doing classical pencil studies or because I didn't get into art to render an elbow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like at a, at a certain level, I'm like, yes, these exercises are crucial and please, please, please study as much as humanly possible. But after all that studying, what are you doing with it? And I'm starting to have that revelation and kind of coming around to that, which sounds really obvious, but I, I guess I was so kind of burnt out. I was like, man, what do I need to paint today? What do I need to paint today? I don't know what to study. And then I, I kind of caught myself. I was like, oh, wait, what am I talking I don't need to study necessarily. Like, it's good to do that, but am I not going to paint or am I not going to draw or am I not going to even try because I don't have something to study? That doesn't make sense. Like, if people want to hire me, if people are looking at my portfolio and if I'm maybe on their short list to hire, are they going to pick somebody? Uh, let's say the skills are equal across me and another person. Let's say I have all these studies, all these beautiful renders, all this type of stuff. But the other person maybe doesn't have as many studies, but they have more imaginative realism. They're absolutely going to pick imaginative realist artists over me. No question. I mean, I would. If I was hiring, I would look at the person that had the, the slight modicum of imagination. <laughs> of, oh, here's something I've never seen before. Versus, yeah, that's a really good, highly rendered apple. Because at the end of the day, like, yeah, sure, you can have a technical skill set. And I will tell you, that is a huge benefit when I'm teaching. To be able to have the chops to be able to be like, okay, in 30 brush strokes, make a landscape. You know what I mean? Because I've done that. I've done that exercise hundreds of times. And I know what that looks like and how to solve that puzzle. But how can I bring that forward into my imaginative art? I think now instead of flexing my technical ability or technical skill, I have to flex my imaginative skill. I have to start showing people things that maybe they haven't seen before, or maybe they have seen before, but it's a slight tweak or a slight twist. And it's funny, I started this painting in particular with the intent like, oh, I a lot of my stuff on my portfolio is flat. It just looks flat. <laughs> Ironically, at the end of this, at the end of this, you know, I put, I think this full thing took about two hours of real-time painting. 
at the end, I was like, ah, finally it's done. And I zoomed out and I laughed at myself because I was like, God, it's flat. Like <laughs> everything's sideways. Every this guy's looking in a profile shot. The it's still flat. Like it has some depth, but everything is kind of a cutout. And you know, maybe my next thing to level up as far as a skill that I could study that would kind of tie into this would be dynamic poses. Having really crazy comic book proportions, maybe having foreshortening, that's something I'm like terrified of. So maybe that's a thing I do need to train, but the way I could train instead of doing my, 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 uh, let's see, what's his name? Bogart. Like I have a lot of anatomy books and even the, the drawing comics, the Marvel way, I have all that stuff. But instead of doing the textbook examples, what if I start making something from imagination first? Then, once I hit my roadblocks, once I hit my areas, I start going like, I don't know if this arm looks right. Then start looking at reference. Because I'm very much, since I'm a, a very traditional, visual, uh, I guess like figurative artist, I was trained doing hundreds of still lives. Draw what you see, draw what you see, not what you think you see, but what you really see. And that whole motif was driven into my head, God, from the age of 16 until even now. It's like, oh, draw the shapes and draw the forms and draw this and that. And, that. and it's so academic and very, this is either right or wrong, that I think what I need to do is I need to kind of bring, be easier on myself, allow the imagination to make things up. Because if, you know, it's great to have reference, and I, I'm a very big advocate, you should use, however much reference you think you should use, use twice that much, and your art's going to be better. It just is, because you're going to be looking at the real thing, and something, you're going to add more believability, people are going to get more invested, it's just the way it is. But I think I'm at that point now, after working pro for about two years, Maybe I need to ease up. Maybe I need to just start working on instinct. See how much is actually coming automatically now instead of everything, every piece of this puzzle, every part of this process being step one, step two, step three equals success. What if I do step three first? What if I don't use reference at all until the finishing touches? What if... I use completely different references. What if instead of looking at other fantasy art or video game concept art or, you know, old classical painters, which is kind of my trifecta, that's what I normally do. What if I go to my freaking comiXology account, which I haven't opened in a year, and read through 20 single issues of random comics and see how they're telling stories inside of those panels? Uh, comic artists and illustrators are master storytellers because they have to be. Uh, I, I very much think in the way of a camera lens anyway, and like directing a scene. So why don't I start embracing that more so than what do I think an art director might want to see in order to hire me? And that's a weird thing to break because I need the job. <laughs> Trust me, I need the job. But maybe I'll get the job if I let loose. If I don't, if I don't just do the tropey, this is basically a painting of stick salesman, like uh, travels of stick salesman or whatever that meme is. Big landscape, stick salesman in the foreground, big open vista or whatever in the background. There's billions of those out there that people have seen it before. Um, my, my one thing I added to this was a diamond, <laughs> you know, like and and not to knock my own stuff, but I have to be self-aware. You have to be self-aware. And yeah, the techniques are fun, and I love, like, this is the first time I photo bashed in probably pff, however many months. So it was fun to kind of put in the basic things, then bring in those pictures, and then kind of put them in there, get the texture, get the noise, repaint over it. Like, that's a lot of fun. It's like kid in a candy store type stuff. But is the idea good? Is it good enough? Is it interesting? I bet it could be more interesting if it was not a flat profile shot. But that's my instinct. And I think it's because all of the stuff that I train for goes hand in hand with doing profiles and portraits and still life and everything is on a flat plane and, you know, get the depth because of the light and all this stuff. And that's very much akin to my training. 
but what if I know for a fact there's something beyond that? So how can I go further faster? And I think it's to embrace the stuff that's not academic. Embrace the stuff that's truly instinctual. Um, make it more dynamic. Make it more... Be able to invest in it. Not only as like an art director, but as a viewer. Like Our goal as artists should be should be to make something that either inspires or you know touches someone or whatever or or resonates with them in a way that for that split second for that moment you as the artist and them as the viewer are connected and i think that's the goal and you know you have to be hard on yourself sometimes which which i'm in that state right now but it's good cuz i think that's a sign of growth i think that's a sign of okay there's going to be another level up very soon because now I'm starting to question all of it. And it's like, why did I get into this? I got into this because I loved being that kid. I remember at Best Buy, I was at, with my buddy Mitchell. We were like, I think him and I were like, we were on the academic team or the you know quiz bowl or whatever. And as a, as a nice treat, our, our parents, who were the, the chaperones, uh, let us go to Best Buy afterwards. Because it was just me and him. We made it to the finals. And it's like, all right, man, we, we can kind of get whatever we want as a gift. And I saw this huge box set. And the box set had Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, Icewind Dale 1 and 2, Neverwinter Nights 1 and 2, all of like collected uh, expansions and all that stuff with it too on DVD. I still have it somewhere. I think it's called the Forgotten Realms Collection. And I think it's worth an insane amount of money now. Um, I still have it. And I remember just being blown away with it and those games were so even now i get excited thinking oh i could reinstall boulders gate i could play through that go to candle keep you know i could i could hit some of this up again that's my that's my investment that's that's where i come from and i hope to maybe one day make some art that inspires someone that same way that that these games and the the literature and the paintings i mean you know todd lockwood's a freaking master um, <laughs> so all these old D and D artists and magic and, you know, sci-fi stuff and Warhammer and, oh, it's bigger than life. I want to make stuff that's bigger than life. Maybe I need to trust my instinct, not worry so much about how well the boot is rendered. Just get out there, make cool dynamic stuff. Maybe that will get me further faster. So I hope this kind of tirade, <laughs> uh, kind of open up some doors for you. Maybe, maybe think about that. Maybe think about, what is the thing that's holding you back? Maybe you're great at working from imagination, but it's just not as believable as you'd like it to be. Maybe that means it is time to study. Maybe it's time to do some render stuff. Maybe it's time to find some classical paintings, do master studies, figure out how they do that. But if you're in my train of thought and you're like, okay, I've done the draw box thing. I've done, I've done, you know, these anatomical studies. I've done this type of stuff. Very, very textbooky, very educational, academic Maybe I need to let go of that. Maybe I need to throw it away for right now. Because who knows how much of it I actually learned. And this would be a good test to do that. But that's it. That's my time. Thank you all so much for the support. Leave a comment. Let me know. What's the thing that you should just embrace? Embrace it, man. Just embrace it. It's going to be the thing that fills your creative tank. Gets you that momentum to level up. Get better. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear it in the comments. But until next time, guys, take care. Go make cool art, and we'll see you next time. Peace.